Hello everyone, this is Michael Hart. I'm your presenter for this professional development series on dyslexia. In this module, we're going to talk about understanding the bright child with dyslexia and how they actually look in the classroom. Now, after speaking with thousands of teachers over the last 25 years, I've come to realize that this is one of the most challenging issues with a dyslexic child. Their cognitive processing profiles are oftentimes so complex that it's quite confusing what you're seeing in the classroom and why there seems to be such a discrepancy in their behavior across different tasks. So I'm going to try to shed some light on that for you. I'm going to try to create a template for you that will help you better understand and identify these kids and figure out what to do about it. Now I'm going to tell you this is probably one of the more complicated modules in this series. But of course, you can always contact me with questions and you can review the module at will. And for this particular topic, I provided some specific links at the end of the module in addition to the overall bibliography of resources. So I think there's some really wonderful resources out there for you that uh, will really aid in your understanding of, of who these kids are, what they look like in the classroom, and what to do about it. Now, oftentimes, these children are defined as twice exceptional kids or 2E kids. Now, according to the International Dyslexia Association, this twice exceptional label is the term that's used to describe students who are intellectually gifted and quote unquote learning disabled, which includes dyslexia. Now, you are going to hear me use the terms intellectually gifted and bright students interchangeably. And I think that the, over time you'll understand why I do that. I'm obviously quite aware that there is a specific protocol for um, intellectually gifted kids in your district, as well as a specific protocol for establishing learning disabled uh, labels as well. But I thought that it kind of goes beyond that. So I used the National Association of for Gifted Children's kind of rubric for the three types. And that is like the, the first is the identified quote unquote gifted students who also have a learning disability. So they've been identified in both ways. That's quite rare. Then you have the group that are students who have been identified as learning disabled or who have dyslexia, who've not been identified as gifted or exceptionally bright. And then you have the kids who have neither been identified as either especially bright or um, dyslexic. And those kids are what we call the invisible kids. And oftentimes they're invisible because when you just take a look at their school achievement, it just looks average. But we're not really drilling down into the more granular understanding of their overall profile so we can make sense of these odd discrepancies that we see in the classroom. So what do our 2E students really look like? Now, I know uh, that many of you have encountered these kids. Every one of you have encountered these kids. And they're incredibly confusing at times because they have extraordinary vocabulary. They have these incredibly advanced ideas. They're, they're creative. Um, they have these, sometimes they have these wonderful talents or interests in a certain area. But at the same time, with regard to their basic academic skills, reading, writing, and spelling, they are nowhere near as adept in uh, exhibiting strengths in that area as they are in these other areas that you see in the classroom. And that is, the key thing here is that there are very significant peaks and valleys in their overall cognitive profile. So we really need to have a, a solid base of understanding what, of all those different kinds of uh, peaks and valleys in their different skills across a pretty broad range of, of skills. Now, in the bibliography at the end, I included this YouTube video. It's actually a TEDx Sonoma County presentation that's called The Myth of Average. 
And I found it to be extremely useful in terms of kind of expanding our lens, expanding our awareness of, all right, how we really need to take a look at these kids and how to kind of blow out this idea of um, just assuming average or not average. Now, implicit in what I'm saying is that we're using testing scores, right? We're going to use testing scores to assess, for the most part, we're going to assess uh, who's who's ostensibly gifted and uh, who has specific symptoms of dyslexia. Now, of course, we know that the process for determining giftedness is not standardized. You know, there's a lot of interpretation that, that happens between the federal level and the state level and how that's interpreted by the district. So we have a challenge there. We have a challenge with the whole concept of having a really bright kid with dyslexia and having them tested for both things because if we haven't been introduced to these models and we haven't been introduced to what these profiles look like we're going to oftentimes overlook them so again i circle back to this idea that as educators it's not always going to be your responsibility to identify these kids and push for testing and all that business i know the that's challenging. There's all kinds of legal issues with that. But if the parents have been working hard to maintain a positive relationship with you and they've educated themselves about this profile of, of really smart kids who also have dyslexia, then they could be more effective as an advocate in terms of what actually we do in the classroom. And so that's, I know this is a bit provocative, but regardless of IEPs and 504s, just knowing this about our kids, just knowing that, that that's their overall profile is going to be really helpful for you and actually make your job easier as opposed to harder. Now, with testing comes lots of other issues. You know, there's mixed feelings about using just the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. But I thought in most circumstances, and I won't say all circumstances, because if you've been with a child for many years and you know they're super bright, and there's no legal reason, then sometimes you don't IQ test. But when IQ tests are just kind of thrown out the window and psychologists are left out of the process, that's that increases the danger that these uh, two wee kids end up being invisible. You know, you, you you don't have the you don't have the template for understanding that th this incredible reasoning ability surfaces in the classroom. But it's not being demonstrated in written work, which even today, even in this day, leads far too often to this concept that, you know, if your kid just worked harder, you know, they're smart but lazy. And we want to make sure that we really avoid that trap because that's going to have a significant impact on our child's ability to function in the classroom. So you need to know what you're looking at. So in other words, I used to say the old the old saying is you need to know what you see, not just see what you know. So I do believe that there is a role for IQ testing, but we need to make sure that we're skilled in terms of how we uh, interpret those tests and not 100% rely on a bunch of um, subtests or a bunch of scores. Because what we know, what do we know about IQ testing? It doesn't test everything. It doesn't test everything about intelligence. In the last 20 years, there's been, as you know, a number of new models for assessing quote-unquote intelligence. We know that the WISC is, uh, there's a real danger of using the composite level scores and not drilling down into the subtest scores. And I'll have an example of that in a little while, but we talked about this before where, you know, if you've, if you don't pay attention to the subtest scores and you don't pay attention to the discrepancies between those subtest scores, then you're missing out on a huge amount of information that's going to help you understand how this child's brain is wired and why there might be issues with reading, writing, and spelling. And of course, traditional IQ testing does not measure creativity. Uh, it doesn't measure your ability in art. It doesn't measure, you know, certain just aspects of who the whole person is and what and how that's going to inform how they perform in a classroom. So I take you back to an earlier discussion we had 
about understanding all the components to an effective evaluation for your job. You may remember this uh, beautiful this beautiful drawing that I make for every for every child that I get tested. So here, what we're talking about is that in many cases IQ testing is important, but the soft information that's collected is oftentimes super critical for these kids. And by this I mean these are observational notes from the parents, from the teachers, from anybody else who's been in the classroom who has the skill set to understand what they're seeing, to the questionnaires that have been asked of you. This is all about the area where we document who this person is above and beyond just test scores. And because we're not perfect in the tests that we have, and because those tests don't uh, don't particularly measure the value or the strengths of, of many of our kids in this category of bright with dyslexia, then it behooves us to capture this data as well, because that allows us to have an intelligent conversation about what we can do for them. Now, there's a dynamic here that I think is really critical for us to understand because um, it's super tough on these kids if we don't identify them early then what happens is that over time their capability for compensating their issue their ability to comp to compensate for their weaknesses um, gets increasingly diminished over time so in the very early years you may see a kid who is seemingly developed reading skills but when you take a very close look you'll see that they're actually you know they're using contextual cues from the pictures Maybe they're reading it with their parents and they're actually memorizing the text so that they know, you know, when they're in the classroom, this is how they're supposed to act like they're reading. But what you'll begin to see is that weird discrepancy between this extraordinarily bright verbal kid who still nonetheless is coming in as low average grades. And it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then over time, you know, you see kids in high school who are you know, they're, they're very, very bright, and they're kind of holding on academically, but it's because when you're giving an hour's worth of homework, what you think is going to be an hour's worth of homework to your kids, this little guy over here, this little girl over here, is spending three to five hours because they have to muscle their way through to compensate for their weaknesses. And they're still getting average grades, but it's so inconsistent with what they're truly capable of doing if we structure the learning experience um, properly. And then you get into the situation for a lot of these kids so that their data over the years doesn't support the idea that they should be in a gifted program. And at the same time, you know, the data doesn't support that they really need accommodations or remediation. So they're stuck in this, this gray world in the middle that um, could oftentimes carry them. I mean, it just leads to years and years of, of uh, frustration and tension and uh, kids really questioning who they are and what they're capable of. We need to start making sure that we're focusing on the strengths and not just over-organizing around the weaknesses. Now, I'll apologize. This is a terrible picture, but it's the best I could get because this is a this is a screen um, shot from uh, YouTube. Um, this is a wonderful example of a really, really smart kid who struggled mightily with learning how to read. And he was a source of great confusion for the teachers for many, many years. So he gets tested. And you'll see here, first of all, the WISC is the old WISC. So there's two composite scores. There's a verbal IQ score and the performance IQ score. You see that at the top there, the VIQ and the PIQ. Now the verbal IQ score of 137 is like 99.9% percentile. So that child is a bright, as bright or brighter than 99.9% .9 of kids uh, in their age group. And you can see, if you remember, the whisk of the average score on a subtest, like vocabulary, comprehension, similarities is 10. So you'll see that all those subtests combined to provide an overall score of 137. Now interesting to note here is that 
in a verbal area, this child is massively skilled um, across all the subtests. A little bit of degradation here, which we usually can describe as an issue with the, uh, just manipulating working memory. And even though there's a little bit of lower set of scores over in the performance IQ, the child still earned a 119, which is quite frankly one score, one point away from the superior range. So this child becomes, comes to the classroom loaded with significant intellectual capabilities. They want to be an engineer. They can barely learn, they can barely read for years and years and years in the school setting. Yet at the same time at home, they're building these kinds of things. This massive, uh, I don't know what you call it, but this massive edifice in his bedroom. So there is just such a beautiful representation of the disconnect between the power that they have in their brain and the specific processing difficulties which directly bump up against the ways in which we're supposed to be able to prove our capabilities in the classroom. I really, it's about, this is about a 12 minute video. I really strongly urge you to take a look at it. It's really illuminating and I think it's a great lesson for us that'll help us build out our own template as we take a look at our own kids. Now let's talk about tips, what you can actually do. I've mentioned the early intervention. I do know that it's tough to get testing approved, but once you really start to think about, uh, you know, the discrepancy between what the child may be doing verbally and what the child's doing in terms of learning how to read, write, and spell, uh, I think there's there can be an argument there. Um, it, it, at this point, it's really important to address the underlying issues because, as you are probably aware, the statistics are clear. If a child does not become an effective reader by third grade, there's a four times more likely chance that that child is going to not make it through high school because if they don't get past the third grade level, the second grade level, then, you know, they're not going to get the support they need to continue to build their reading skills unless we move in and provide early intervention. So this comes, this takes us to a point where this is, could be somewhat provocative and somewhat, not provocative really, but it's, it's a hot spot. And it really, it really reflects the power and the importance of collaboration between the school team and the parents, regardless of the 504 or IP status. Now, I don't know how you're responding to this, obviously, but it really speaks to the fact that we've got to find ways to work together and organize around this child differently so that they can accommodate for the weaknesses that they have. And we can also start identifying where they're going to shine so we can support that for them. Now, I know that many of you who have, you know, 150 kids that you see in, in middle school or high school, that this is kind of a hot spot for you. But I also know that teachers always have two or three kids that somehow touch them in a way that they get the little bit of extra time and they get the little bit of extra attention. And you're, there's an actual ability to develop a, an, an authentic relationship with these kids. And I think if we can take the time to maintain positive relationships, then we can really think differently about how we're providing our kids with what they need, especially these kids where it's so easy for them to get lost in the system because we as adults have missed the boat. We also, part of the early intervention component is to get these kids ready for third grade uh, because they need to know that they're going to get a, there's going to be a big bump. And so we need to make sure that we're preparing them for that bump. What I, what I mean by that is obviously the environmental or the academic demands uh, increase dramatically when a child reaches third grade. They're expected to be more self-directed. They're expected to um, have developed their literacy, literacy skills to a certain level, and therefore they're expected to create more output relative to what they were doing earlier. So we have to be careful because sometimes this is an inflection point where 
the child struggles so much with the basics of reading, writing, and spelling, but they're so bright, they tend to lose their interest and they tend to avoid and get a, and try to hide. So we want to make sure that we're conscious of that and we're not misinterpreting what that child's lack of interest or that child's avoidance means. Because that can be doubly confusing when you know that the child is super bright and yet they're avoiding learning. Because in the pure sense, all kids love to learn. But when they are faced with failure on a day-to-day -day basis, then they're going to want to, you know, they're, they're kids, so they're going to want to avoid that pain. Now, the next point I make has to do with educational technology. And I know that across the board, there are so many different kind of Policies and policies and procedures with regard to introducing educational technology into your schools. But I would say this, I would say that we do not want to wait. We want to introduce that technology as quickly as possible because it is the educational technology, i.e. tablets, voice to text, text to voice, is the most profound thing that's happened for dyslexic kids since we knew how to treat these kids. And I'm talking about over a 50 year period. It's the most profound thing that we can use to help accommodate roadblocks in producing output. And when you have a really bright kid, they tend to take to the educational technology because it's exciting and it's you know bright, shiny lights. But the truth of the matter is that voice to text and certain apps like WhisperSync and the services that Learning Ally provide for uh, audiobooks and so forth are absolutely critical. And we need to make policies at the administrative level that we do not wait to introduce this technology as a way to give these kids some relief. Now, also, even in the elementary school level, we want to be careful about their social and emotional well-being because this is when kids are going to start to shut down. And if they shut down now it's going to be increasingly more challenging for us because as the demands grow, their sense of incompetence grows as well. And that's just going to lead to more shutting down or conversely more acting out. So I think just maintaining a close watch on social emotional well-being. Now, I understand that there's a lot of reasons why a child may, may present with various social emotional issues that are impeding their performance. Uh, but it behooves us to make sure we know what is driving that. Because if, it's, if it falls under our bailiwick, then we've got to deal with it. In terms of middle school, obviously, sixth grade is a huge hurdle. In terms of expectations for self-direction, expectations with regard to output. And we know for sure that if these kids have been invisible for the first five years, then their output is going to be rather diminished or rather underdeveloped relative to their overall capabilities in other areas. So in addition to inter continued intervention here in the middle school years, we can also begin to start developing. Well, actually, you can do this in the, in, in the elementary schools, but as kids get older and they're more comfortable with self-advocating, then we start, we start to build the language that they need to use. We start to build their own awareness about what their strengths and weaknesses are. And we help them try to find ways to build and can maintain resilience in spite of the fact that uh, the majority of things they're asked to be, they're asked to do in the school setting is not where they shine. A lot of times these kids super bright and the academic environment is someplace where they're just not going to shine. So we have to start the process of building these self-advocacy advocacy skills and hold, hold, helping them maintain their resilience. Now, the next module is all about building resilience and helping them maintain that. So we're going to get into much greater detail with that in the next module. And of course, we need to continue to iterate. If the child has an educational technology plan, we've got to take a look at uh, uh, how we're implementing that, whether we have a 504 or an IEP. Now, this may also be a bit provocative, but I think it bears thinking about. 
And that is that, uh, you know, towards the end of middle school, this may be the beginning of marshalling resources outside of the school environment. Now, I know that tutoring is really a function of what the parents are doing, unless their IEP or their 504 calls for it at this level. But this is all about the beginning of the process of determining if a child has certain gifts or if a child has something that, in their life that they're massively passionate about. We want to start thinking about how we might be able to kind of integrate that into their curriculum. You know, was that an online course? You know, is that a, a science course? Are we, are we plugging them into the Khan Academy? Are we, if they're super, super bright, are we plugging them into the Johns Hopkins uh, program for uh, exceptional children? You know, is it, a, is it uh, an opportunity for them to learn more about art at uh, one of the major institutions across the world or maybe dance or whatever it is that that helps that child shine you know is it as we move towards the end of middle school is that a good time to start thinking about the resources outside the school environment that are going to help this child see themselves as being adequate or see themselves as being gifted in areas other than these reading writing and spelling demands that are continuing to be challenging because remember dyslexia does not go away and even with support they're going to be challenged as they reach these new thresholds for environmental demands now as we reach high school uh, again I think that this is a um, and in many ways the most difficult time but also the time with the most opportunity and perhaps the most flexibility because obviously now we're talking about of course another major developmental leap in terms of self-regulation but we're also starting to think about what this child's life is going to look like and it gives us an opportunity in this day and age because of the internet because of educational technology because of the platforms that we have out there to start thinking about how are we going to channel this child's energy in ways that are going to allow them to succeed in life. And if they have been struggling for 9, 10, 11 years in the traditional educational environment solely because they have this language processing issue that manifests as dyslexia, then I think it behooves us to stop and think about how can we try to find some ways for this child to feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now this is again really speaks to another core issue with regard to establishing and maintaining positive relationships between the school team and the parents. I know there's a lot of issues with regard to what's realistic, but I think that I have to speak in terms of um, what we should aspire to. And hopefully in more cases than not, we actually are successful in that area. And I know that can be very challenging I think the message to the kids is, is that the school team and the parents never give up. And that's reflected in their behavior and their way that they work with each other. And of course, you always catch more bees with honey than you do vinegar. Now, this gets really complicated in a lot of ways because there are legal issues and there's uh, curriculum issues and all that other business. But Likely, there's a lot of kids that need updated testing because the parents are trying to see if they can get um, accommodations for the child when they go to a college. But I think it also provides another great opportunity that if they do a good eval, if the person does a good evaluation, then it can be framed as a planning tool for independence for the child. So it's a basis for discussion with the parents and the child. And I know you could be sitting there listening, so what's this have to do with me? I think if you maintain strong relationships with the parents, you're going to be able to support the parents efforts in their conversations with the child, or you may be able to collaborate with them in ways that you never thought about before. Now, is this a child that should go to college? Uh, would they be happier in specialized like a trade or training of some sort? Uh, I have talked with, families lately about building kind of a, a derivative curriculum where half the day they're at home with homeschooling and half the day 
they're at the school or maybe they're in a work environment. Now the homeschooling, I know I've mentioned this several times before that kids aren't going to get the support and phonological processing development and so on and so forth. And people who are teaching a subject aren't required to teach a kid how to learn how to read. But if you remember in the earlier modules, we talked about, you know, at this stage, we do need to focus to some degree on the phonological issues if they still are struggling in that area. But we also want to think about strategies for making use of the databases that they have for comprehension in order to become a skilled reader. And I've seen cases lately where we've had to think way out of the box and we put together a curriculum that had the kid at home part day, school part day, sometimes school part day, sometimes work in a work environment, so that we begin that transition period in a organized fashion. And they don't just keep getting smushed through a normal curriculum for 12 years and then they get sent out into the world. So it's a way for us to think about how those kids can shine in the world. And let's do, let's do some planning here. Let's talk about how we can set this kid up for success and let them know again that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, their self-advocacy and resilience skills, well, the self-advocacy skill, advocacy skills for sure need to be more sophisticated as they prepare to go out into the real world because it's not as simple uh, as in school when you're required to implement something. I think you just need to be really skilled at explaining who you are, what your strengths are, and how you can do the job as best you can. So I think, I think this is a bit atypical, obviously. And if you have 150 kids uh, and you're teaching a class at the senior level, you know, this may not be always realistic for you, but I think I'd like to just ask you to put this in your template because there are going to be times where you can participate in this. Remember, you're not, it's not your job to do this, but it's your, it's your opportunity, if you have the opportunity, to participate in this kind of discussion or decision making or uh, support even for a child who has this really atypical uh, profile and is going to need a little bit extra buffing up to go to the next level and go out into the real world. Now, I'm going to finish with this basically. And, you know, we, we, we have to have some compassion for ourselves because these children are really complicated and we're going to be successful sometimes and we're not going to be successful sometimes. We're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out, well, this worked, this didn't work. What are we going to do instead? So, you know, I just like to, I like to show this and say, this is really, this is really what success looks like. And so we have a little bit of compassion for ourselves, a little bit of compassion for our parents and compassion for our kids. And we just keep firing away and doing the best we can. Now, as I mentioned, uh, I've embedded these resources right here at the end of this module. I think I feel like I've covered a lot of, you know, pretty complicated information. And it's still, again, it's just kind of an introduction. So these will be also in the bibliography, but I wanted to give you a, a kind of pull them out and let you know that there's some great stuff here. The uh, first one is the YouTube about the kid who uh, is the 100 and what, 37 IQ. And then the Hoagie's Gifted Education page is really kind of a repository of information, largely about gifted kids, but also gifted kids who do have dyslexia as well. Thought you might find that to be useful in some degree. Uh, the Myth of Average, again, is the TEDx talk from Sonoma County. Todd Rose has a fabulous personal story himself, quite frankly, where he was a um, high school dropout and uh, failed miserably, ended up at Harvard, and now is a leading expert in the country with regard to uh, uh, certain educational issues. And then as we, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about building resilience in your students' 
in the next module, but I gave a webinar for Learning Ally in June of 2014, and I thought I would share that uh, PDF with you now, and uh, we can talk about it, obviously, in greater detail in the next module. So again, thank you very much, and be sure to contact me with any questions. You have my email address now. You can, you can get to me directly. And uh, please don't hesitate because I want to I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your questions. And uh, if, if possible, I'd like to really start a dialogue. So uh, thanks for listening. We're going to um, we'll see you in the next one.